Okay, so let's begin. Firstly, welcome to our Concert Tours webinar. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Katie Boyden. I'm the Joint Managing Director of Raven Tours. And Raven Tours is a family run business and we specialise in group travel. And we've been operating tours for over 55 years now. We have a number of specialist departments, one of which is our Concert Tours department. And the concert team work with all types of music ensembles for all ages and planning exciting performance opportunities worldwide. My brother Jamie and I oversee the running of the company and actually it would usually be Jamie that would be talking to you today to open the webinar as that normally falls into his remit. But today you've got me and there's a reason for that and that's because I'm the musical one in our family along with my mum and therefore I've always had a really keen interest in our concert tours product. Obviously I'm really passionate about all the different types of tours we offer but the concert tours are definitely my favourite. No doubt, like all of you here today, um, music has been a huge part of my life from a really early age. My mum was a class music teacher and a peripatetic music teacher. She played four instruments and sang in several choirs. And it was listening to her teaching students in our house when I was probably about three or four years old that made me want to really learn to play instruments and to sing. And that's where my music interest began. Um, but as I grew a little bit older, I wanted to take it further and I studied at a GCSE and then A-level and then I went on um, to study at Leeds University. Um, and, in, and in my opinion, there's nothing better than coming together with like-minded people to perform music. And whilst music is just a hobby for me, it is my most favourite pastime and I absolutely love singing in the two choirs that I belong to. Like me, our concert tours team is also made up of people with a passion for music and, of course, travel. And we all really understand how exciting it is and the benefits that you gain by travelling with your group and performing together. There's nothing like it. But this event is not about us, it's about you. It's been a really tough 18 months and it seems that having all these amazing performance opportunities taken away from music groups has led to a lot of pent up demand to get exciting tours booked in the diary for 2022 and beyond. But for first time tourers and seasoned pros alike, there are also a lot of questions that crop up when you're thinking about going away. And I'm hoping that today our panel can help answer those questions. We really find you find it useful today and I'm going to hand over to Nikki now to get things started. Welcome everybody. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to be hosting this event. Um, today is a very good day at the Rayburn office because not only is this our first concert tours webinar, but we've also had the welcome news that the Department for Education have announced that schools can start planning and booking international trips from the autumn term. It goes without saying this is a huge relief for everyone, but it's also obviously an opportunity for people like yourselves, especially those youth ensembles in schools. So my role in this section of the webinar is to keep things on track, make sure we stick to time and get you out the door um, in good time. But it's also to make sure you get that absolute most out of the event. That is the most important thing. So what to expect? So first of all, um, all our speakers will speak back to back. I will introduce each of them. They will take to the floor, deliver their session. If you have arrived at this event with burning questions, we're gonna ask you to please use the chat function in Zoom, start posting them, whether it be general questions that you want to put out to the panel or whether it's something specific to a particular speaker, then please make that very apparent in the question. My team in the background will be collecting those together and once the speakers are finished, I will be delivering those to the floor and the panel. If you do have a question that you just feel you can't elocute properly, um, via kind of the text format, then please make that apparent um, when you post in the chat and we're more than happy for you to switch your mic on if we come to you and you can deliver that um, question verbally. Um, we do aim to try and get through all the questions. If for some reason we can't, we will answer those questions after the event and we will email you all so that you do go away with this with all the information you need. So hopefully, I think that's everything I've got covered. So let's begin. So our first speaker is Jason Andrews. So in my first conversations with Jason, it was hugely inspiring to hear that he'd been lucky enough to enjoy the performance experiences on concert tours um, at different U European venues in his youth. So then when he qualified as a teacher and became head um, of depart the music department at Red Knot School, he was absolutely driven and committed to recreating those wonderful experiences that he'd had as a child. 
He's massively passionate about touring. He's a great friend of ours. So I know you're eager to speak about your uh, top tips and advice, Jason. So I'll pass the floor to you. I must just quickly say how pleased I am to do this. I mean, talking about something which has been my passion now for a number of years, just uh, it's just wonderful. So thank you, Nikki, for this opportunity. And thanks to Rayburn. Great. OK, so there are two elements to my um, little speech and that's to do with the personnel that you take on the tour and also engaging the momentum in a tour which is so crucial to its success. So if I start with the personnel first and apologies to those of you who who aren't working in schools who are organizing tours for adults if some of the information I give you is very much school-based but that's my area of expertise and I'm sure there is quite a lot of crossover as well. But um, the normal ratio that we have taking students away is one to 12 plus one. And so typically I'd be looking to take um, staffing of about four or five if it was a bus load of 43, 44 students or so. Um, I, I normally take one extra than is recommended so that if somebody's poorly on the trip and it can often happen, or if a member of staff needs to take um, a student to the doctors or anything like that, then you do have that backup. And to fund this, what, what we normally do is add the little extra payment for the staff into what the, the students pay to go on the trip. And, you know, amongst 45 of them, it accounts to very little. But I actually think it's really worth having that extra member of staff. I, I, that's the first thing I'd like to say. And taking away personnel that get on together of course is so important you're going to spend 24 hours or so on a coach together you're going to be sharing rooms at the hotel you're going to be with the kids the whole time and um, you're going to be eating your meals together and I think that if they invest with the tour early on and they they maybe even perform um, these adults with the, the groups during the concerts it builds up that that friendship and that professional uh, rapport with each other before you go on the tour. So I would strongly suggest um, if you haven't got a team already and you're going on tour for the first time is picking people that you feel that you can trust 100 percent. And I mean 100 percent because you're going to be um, giving them the trust with other people's children. And there's nothing more precious than that is there. So. Um, just because they happen to be teachers at the school or just because they even work in the music department. I don't think that's sufficient for a tour. You need to feel that the, the personnel that you have are comfortable with the situation. So if they haven't been on, on a tour with you before, ask them if they've been away with the school and what was their experience. And gauge from that whether you feel that they are suitable or that they're confident enough. And if they're a bit new to it, maybe take them out with the students to concerts or invite them for after dinner drinks to engage with the other staff um, who may be um, you know, more com confident of what you're proposing and um, get them used to what it's like to, to be going on the tour. Um, so um, another way you can think about this as well is from a financial point of view, because schools need cover teachers if you're out of school. So if you're taking away a number of staff during term time, the implications of that are costly for the school. So one way I get around this is that I go the first week of the summer term, uh, sorry, the summer holiday at the end of the summer term. And that negates any issues to do with finance for the school. And it also allows me to take away the, um, the personnel that I really want to take. OK, so I can choose the people I, I want to go with and I think are suitable for the tour, whether that's peripatetics or um, can be an ex-student. It can be a parent. It doesn't really matter who it is as long as they're DBS checked and they're committed to the tour in the same way that you are. We've got the same ethos about it. OK, so, um, yeah, um, I think mixing it up is good as well. So taking away maybe a parent who is a responsible adult who you know well, but doesn't play in your orchestras or sing in your choirs can be quite effective because they can oversee the equipment when you're performing outdoors, keep an eye on things. They could take some photographs of the group. They could video the event for you um, and just have the, the extra eyes on the situation because you are out in, in public and, um, you know, not everybody out there can be trusted. So, yeah, having an extra pair of eyes for somebody who doesn't perform really, really useful. Um, in the mix, of course, I've got to mention you need a first aider. 
So you need somebody who's trained for first aid. And, um, you know, you, you'll find that with a school party, you won't be able to go on the trip unless you have that first aider. And it's important that they, they are qualified in that and they're up to speed with current principles associated with it as well. OK, and if you get a good group and I've had a good group for some years now, keep them together, get them excited about the next tour. Um, you know, don't, don't think of it as a one off. Um, you know, there's no barriers to age. Um, keep them going, get them on the next tour. If you get a good team, they're worth their weight in gold. They really are, uh, especially if the, if the students love their company as well and, and they engage with them. OK, so that, that's what I wanted to say about personnel and I'm happy to answer questions on that later, of course. Uh, moving on now to momentum. Um, something I'm going to struggle with in my five minutes, I can tell you, because I could talk about tools forever. So I'm going to race through this really, really quickly because momentum's everything to the tour. As soon as I give the letters out, which is about 18 months before we go on tour, that's for me when the tour starts. And the actual tour itself is the icing on the cake. Because what makes a really, really fantastic tour is the build-up and the momentum to that tour. If you book early, you'll get a discount with any tour operator, which is also an advantage. And um, the first thing you need to do, of course, is just talk and promote the tour to all the students and the staff involved. So Rayburn will do uh, me a really nice poster, professional looking poster that I'll put everywhere in the music department. I'll put it all around the school. I'll put it online, you know, everywhere I can. Um, and, you know, all the, the concerts that you do in the run up to the tour. And maybe even a concert series will help promote the tour because everybody's engaged over that time in the run up to the tour. So I feel like I'm almost there from the, from the moment I start. Um, sadly, of course, you know, it hasn't been the case in the last couple of years. I've had to postpone, but that doesn't knock my confidence and my enthusiasm. I just look, I'm just looking forward to getting going again, even more, if anything. Um, I do need to mention then uh, a few things. So, um, yeah, from the time the letters are given out and the poster, organize that concert series, um, download the Rayburn app, and that will keep you up to speed with how your tour's progressing. Um, if you're new to touring, Rayburn have a starter pack, which is a wonderful um, tool to, to get going with if you're new to, new to touring. Um, yeah, um, you can also have um, T-shirts printed as well. You can do fundraising events. Um, it just goes on and on and on. But, you know, I, I have to stop at this point because I'm sure my five minutes is up. But, you know, the, uh, yeah, the momentum is really everything to do with the tour. And I'll, I'll answer some more questions later, I'm sure, about that. Jason, your love for touring is quite infectious and inspiring that obviously you're not only doing this, you know, you teach students all day long, then you run your ensembles outside of school and then you choose to go above and beyond and do this. A couple of things that I li linked onto there thinking about was the timing, you know, and how that gives you access to not choose the personnel that travel with you, more choice. So I think that is a great tip. And I know one thing that I've heard many party leaders talk about before is the whole relationship that changes when you take young people away from the school environment and the relationship that you nurture with those young people as a teacher and it kind of changes that relationship when you come back so thank you so much for all your tips it's been amazing my pleasure so next i'm moving on now swiftly mary Vaughan from singing it back um Mary has been referred to as lighting up a room and I can definitely say when I met Mary I knew why that description was so apt. She is hugely passionate about her choirs even um, to the extent that she brought two choirs together, um, adult choirs to travel together and perform together. Um, while she is engaging she also rules the launch process with a you know an iron rod. It is very structured and she believes this is what makes the whole administration of the tour so successful. So no further ado, I will hand over to you, Mary. Gosh, I sound really scary, don't I? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, yes, I am a choir leader of a community choir and I suspect I, I saw a couple of posters down there, Sing Stasia, maybe you're a community choir like me. Um, many choirs in the community are run by committees. I don't have that luxury, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but actually, I love the fact that I very much worked in tandem with Rayburn. And together, we talked about 
why I might like to take a bunch of people who only really know each other in a singing capacity for two hours every week. How would that possibly be successful? Because when you think about your choir members, that is often the only time they spend together. Uh, they might go to the pub after choir, they might have 20 minutes over a tea break. So the first thing I'm going to say is if you're somebody who has a community choir, my community choirs are 14 years old. So it's taken me 12 years to get to the point of wanting to take them on tour. But that's because I want to feel very confident in that the people who sign up were going to have the best possible time. I do wish I'd done it earlier, um, but I was very busy with my young children at the time when I first started choir. So I think the first thing to ask yourself is why would you want to take your community choir on tour? Um, and my answer to that might be because two hours a week doesn't appear to be enough time for them to get to know each other, but some of them have got extra time on their hands but what do you do for the people who choose not to come on tour and is that going to cause some tension when you get back from tour so have a really good think about that because not everybody's going to be able to come whether that's from a affordability point of view of money flow or indeed an affordability point of view of the time that they can afford to take away so again, I think it's really important that you understand the demographic of your choir. So for example, one of my choirs has a lot of young mums. So it's gonna be quite unreasonable for me to perhaps suggest that they're gonna come away on a Friday and back on a Sunday. So I think I'm gonna go with, you know, Jason, The as soon as you have the idea and you've discussed it with Rayburn, make sure you communicate that idea really very quickly with your singers so that you can start to gauge interest. So of my 100 singers, I have 60 in one choir and I have 40 in another choir. I ended up taking uh, about 40 people from the big choir and only about 10 from the other choir. Um, but I felt really, really confident that they could I would choose repertoire that would really serve them and they could do little separate performances um, that those who were choosing to come they didn't really some of them had mates in choir but some of them didn't um, so again it was going to be thinking about who would share rooms how would they manage that would we say it was going to be a tour with no partners so again i went to the group and said this is what i'm thinking this is the tour that i have in mind let's open it up to partners and i'll let you decide and interestingly nobody wants to bring their partner and i think that's because you know partners are the partner of the choir member is integral to the success of the tour because if you think about it a choir member to even come to choir in the evening needs the support of that partner if they've got children at home so i think it's very important again really look at your demographic of singers don't have this tour in mind that actually isn't going to work for the mum of a five-year-old and a seven-year-old yeah so it's I, for me it's very important to know that it could be something that we could all do where and when are you going to go international we did we went to bruges but it was the closest international um destination we could choose that didn't uh, meant we didn't have to fly we chose to go by coach it was amazing fun. The journey provided time for choir members to get to know each other. Um, sharing of rooms did not become a problem because like Jason, once I'd gauged who wanted to come, I turned the booking around very, very quickly. And the build up to the tour really engaged everybody and everybody knew what to expect. So I'd say again, that's my recommendation. Look at the people in the room, and once you've got their interest, get it booked up and then the excitement can begin for them. And actually, at that point, I was really able to sit back. Like Jason, I engaged a couple of singers from choir that I felt could be my right hand people, just so that when we were there, I always had somebody to count adults heads. They didn't need me to, but actually one did get left behind in, in a lovely in a lovely church in Bruges. So there we are. Even an adult can get lost en route. Um, so where was I? So I was able to sit back a little bit once I'd got that booking done. Once we were on the trip, I think it was really important. These are adults that are coming. They don't need chaperoning all of the time. 
um, but also they don't know each other particularly well. So Rayburn's idea of having a first meal out together was really great and I would really recommend that. But the rest of the meals were taken small groups and they did what they wanted to do. And again, I think that's really important. We don't have to be together all of the time, but give people those options. Um, it was loads of fun. The fact that the um, we had different people to perform to um, and the choirs loved the fact that we had one set of repertoire that we managed to do three times. And you know what it's like with any concert that you've spent you know, all term learning your repertoire for, you get to perform it once, it might only be to your friends and family, and you always want to do it again. So I think again, the great thing about a tour for a community choir is you get a chance to reflect and have a chat over a few drinks and then do it again the next day. The little tours we did, the yeah. day trips we took were amazing. And lastly, I want to say- Lastly. What you, <laughs> lastly, lastly, what do you do with those people who didn't get to come on tour? Because understandably, they're gonna feel a bit like, oh, they've had a great time and it's a bit them and us. Not at all. When we came back to the rehearsal room, we shared the celebrations and it was very much back to business and back to normal rehearsal. And I'm happy to say we are now going postponed twice. We're due to go on a UK tour next May. That's me done. Feel free to ask me any questions later. Fabulous, Mary. Thank you very much. It's one point that I picked up on there was the whole assessing the demographics. So one of the major barriers that we experience here to a tour going ahead is a, a party leader coming absolutely passionate about launching a tour to their choir maybe not judging the demographic quite right or the duration of the tour, whatever it would be. And essentially they just don't get the numbers to make the tour financially viable. So I think that assessment of the demographic is absolutely critical and a brilliant tip. Thank you very much. So next I'm going to move on to Melanie Stapleford from Tapton Youth Brass Band. What can I say? What areas of Europe haven't this brass band toured in? How many hundreds of children have they taken away? I can't hazard a guess, if I'm honest. Um, they've been touring for over 20 years. The brass band is known as a touring band and Melanie firmly believes this is why they are oversubscribed and why people choose, young people choose to take up a brass instrument and play as part of the band. Um, it's a critical part of their reputation, which they aim to maintain. So I look forward to hearing what you've got to say to us today. Over to you. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. OK, I'll start then. OK, hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be able to um, take part in this because I am very passionate about touring and all the tours that we've done with our band. Um, our band, um, just to give you a rough idea, uh, the age range is 12 to 22 years old. Um, and I've been asked to talk to you today about what we get out of touring um, and also a little bit about how we go about fundraising for it. Um, so before I start, I'll just explain that um, I went to the band for a bit of input here when I was thinking about what to talk to you about today. Um, and I went back through some of the comments that uh, the band members had written to us at the end of each tour uh, to see if there are any common themes there that I could, I could pick out. And I also got back in touch with um, a lot of past members that I was still in touch with um, to see if now they're all grown up, whether they have um, a different perspective that they wanted to, to give me. So if I start quoting at you, that's where I've, uh, that's where I've got this information from. So first of all, if I just want to talk about what does the band and the band members themselves get out of it? Um, well, first of all, it's a reason to practice. Um, this is, you know, there's actually something to aim for when you when you announce a tour. Um, there's a reason to improve and to get out of bed and come to the 8.30 rehearsal. Um, we've noticed that the band becomes energised when we announce a tour and all the... Um, the, the individual members, they start to practice harder, they get better, and they, the ensemble just gets better. Um, having to create an hour's programme as well is really good for the band because um, instead of just doing um, a quick set in a school concert, you've actually got to get an hour's worth of uh, material ready, and that really brings the band on. Um, we found there's nothing like a tour for helping the ensemble to get to know each other um, and to socialise with, with each other especially outside their year groups, which doesn't happen quite so much in school. 
Um, and we found that, that that's quite a nice aspect of touring. And it really bonds your ensemble as a unit. Um, you've got the shared purpose beforehand, but then when you've got that shared experience of having been abroad and performed together, lifelong bonds are form, are, you know, they're, they're just lifelong friendships. Um, some of the things that um, the band members have said to me, there are a few things I enjoy more or I'm more proud of than playing on tour in this fantastic band surrounded by people I will stay in touch with for many years to come. Um, another thing is um, the pride at seeing strangers enjoy their performance. Um, this is something that one of the ex-band members uh, got in touch um, to tell me about. He said, I always felt prouder and more sure of the band when playing on tour. Back home, the audience is pretty much parents and band supporters who will cheer whatever you do. But getting such a good reception from total strangers was really gratifying. And that's something I hadn't realised, but it stopped me in my tracks because it made me realise why um, performing on tour is, is so powerful. It instills a sense of responsibility in the band members as well. They're away from home, away from their parents, They're having to think for themselves for a little bit. And we always give every member of the band uh, a responsibility during the week. So they might be picking up the litter off the coach or they might be um, setting out the chairs um, for a concert or handing out the, the, the uniforms, but everybody has something to do. So they develop a sense of responsibility. Uh, we've also noticed that the older ones um, take it upon themselves to look after the younger ones, which is really lovely. And that continues back at school. Um, so there's really nothing better than a Y7 receiving a high five from a, a sixth former in the corridor to really boost that Y7 street cred. Mm. Um, we've also found it gives them um, a lot more confidence around their peers, but also in, in making future choices. Um, they've said things like, I feel way more confident in my playing and socialising after this tour. Before I went on tour, I was shy around strangers, but now I've acquired so much more confidence. And one person got in touch um, who used to be in the band say, experiences on tour made me feel more confident and comfortable going abroad. It meant I felt able to move to Hungary for my degree. Um, but quite simply, you're giving them the best week of their lives. Um, that's the common theme that comes through in all the comments that I, I read from the band. I wish this tour could last forever and I can't wait for the next one. This tour has allowed me to see amazing places with lovely people and I'm so grateful. It's always the highlight of my year. So that's what it does for the band, but what do we as staff get out of it? Well, we do get a hell of a lot of work out of it, it's true. Um, but as Jason says, if you get the right team around you, you can delegate. And if you get that team behind you from the moment that you've booked, then um, really the workload is manageable. It's immensely rewarding. Um, we've, we've made memories that we will treasure forever. Um, we don't do it for the, the thanks, but we do get the grateful thanks from the band members, many of whom um, have gone on to be uh, good friends long after they've left the band and um, started their own families. Uh, quite simply, it's the best thing that we've ever done with our time. I can't think of a better way of spending your energy than in creating a tour for, for young people or for anyone. Um, and so if I've got any time left, I'll just quickly uh, talk nearly about... There. Nearly there. Nearly yeah. there, okay. Um, I'll quickly talk about <coughs> raising money because we subsidise all our band members so that it's affordable. Um, so every time we tour, we raise about £300 per person, which is about £12,000 for the group. So this is quite uh, demanding, um, but it's a lot of fun. And when the kids sign up to the tour, we make them realise that they are committing in full to um, a year of heavy fundraising. And that's part of the deal. Um, we do concerts. Um, often local businesses will donate raffle prizes. Um, we busk outside um, supermarkets at Christmas. This is a brilliant earner. If you uh, get a road to grow with lots of small groups, you can cover many hours and um, we can raise anything between 200 and 300 pounds an hour by doing that. Uh, we also do bag, bag packing at supermarkets. Um, again, get a rotor going with small groups. We can earn about 150 pounds an hour. We hold quiz nights and we get the band members involved, serving food, fetching drinks, that kind of thing. Um, we apply to charitable trusts for support. Um, and there's also the last thing I wanted to say was easy fundraising. If you've not heard of this, if you download that onto your mobile um, devices or onto your computer, then when you um, 
do any shopping through participating retailers, and there are a lot of them, um, they will donate um, a percentage of your spend to your charitable cause. Um, so get all the parents doing this. Um, it comes in drip drip, but um, in 18 months, we've raised £650 just by doing nothing, basically shopping online. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say, um, and I'd be very happy to take any questions at the end. Uh, do you know what? I fell off my seat when you first told me how much you managed to raise um, to enable inclusion for all their participants on the tour, especially when you've got multiple siblings um, within a family. It's hugely inspiring. Um, and it also, you explained to me, gives them a sense of earning their place on the tour. And the fact that you've got gathered all that first hand feedback is brilliant. Thank you so much. OK, so our last speaker is Ian Blenkinsop from City of Bristol Choir. So <sighs> words meticulous um, and fine attention to detail spring to mind when I was speaking to Ian. Um, he finely tunes their itinerary. Their focus is solely on the performances and the quality of those performances. And in order to have that confidence when they arrive on tour, he is a huge advocate of running, running an inspection trip. It means that he's able to visit the location prior to the tour. He's able to enter the venues to see where the stage is, where the audience will sit, what sight lines are like, what rehearsal time there will be available, um, how, you know, the um, nuances of the organ. Um, and our team worked really closely with him to deliver very high quality tours. So we look forward to hearing your advice. Hi, you hearing me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, just to explain, tell you a little bit more about City of Bristol Choir. We're a, we're a fully auditioned choir of about 90 members. And we, we tour on a two year cycle. So basically I start planning the next tour the minute the first one finishes. And what I want to talk about today really is the, important of, the importance of getting as much of your preparation work out of the way before you get on the plane or coach to go to your, your destination. And that actually starts from the minute, even before you ask your members for money, for a deposit. Because if you want to have a successful group, you need to have your members buy in from the earliest possible moment. And that means taking them somewhere where they actually want to go. So what we will normally do is we'll, I will identify with Rayburn, two or three potential venues, maybe different price points, get a rough quote, it won't be right. And I will say to the members, where do you fancy going? And I will, I will, I will literally market research it. And only when I get past that, and I know I've got a destination where people are gonna be interested, only then do I start talking in detail to Rayburn. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna ask for um, deposits from these people. Have a system to track your group size and your payments because people will join, people will withdraw, people will pay money in stages occasionally. If you haven't got a system, you'll get lost very quickly and you won't have a clue when it comes to the balance how much you're asking people for. Okay, you've now got your venue, you started asking for deposits. Start talking to Rayburn about where you're going to sing. Um, if you're touring for the first time, use your coordinator to the absolute maximum. They've organized tours in like these places all the time. They know the venues, but on top of that, do your own research. Find out about the venues they're asking you to go. Uh, for example, if you're not happy singing a cappella, then going to a venue where, the, where there isn't a decent organ or piano is probably not going to be the wisest option. So again, plan your venues before. And then the most important thing, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this, is the pre-inspection visit, because it can save you so much trouble later on. What I'll do is I, I will book a room in the tour hotel. And uh, Rayburn normally find me a very nice rate on this one. So do that through Rayburn. I did actually have one hotel in Spoleto that comped my room, which was even better. Um, and that means if you do that, you know what the hotel's like, you know what the rooms are like. 
And when somebody comes up to you on the first night and says, where's breakfast in the morning? You know where it is. And then visit every, all the venues and make sure you're talking to somebody senior enough to make decisions for them. Because what I want to know when I get in there is, you know, we are a fully auditioned choir. We, we pride ourselves on strength of performance. I want to be in a, in a building two hours before the concert time, at least. And I want my organist in there at least an hour before that, because he is going to need that time to do it. We are going to need that time to rehearse and get changed. Practical things. Are they loose? Can the choir get changed at the venue? What are they looking for by way of performance? Do they want 60 minutes? Do they want two by 30 minutes? Are you singing in a mass? If you're singing in a mass, do they want a sung mass and motets? Do they want just motets? If you don't know this stuff up front, you're going to struggle. The, um, make sure your accompanists can use the organ and, and have a good look at the organ. We went to one place in, in, in the Rhine Valley where I know, discovered that there was no effective sight line for our organist to where the conductor was going to have to stand because your conductor by and large will not be standing where a choir master stands. And organs are normally set up for ease of the choir master, not somebody standing in the nave, conducting 40 people singing from a set of altar steps. And this particular place we actually had to take, um, we, had to, we borrowed some CTT, CCTV equipment so we could actually have our organist with his own camera and he could, he could see it and we could actually use the, the organ in that church, which we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. If I had not done the inspection visit, we, I wouldn't have known about that until it was too late. And I've seen that happen to other touring groups where their organist has not been able to have an effective look, see of where his conductor is. And this choir got totally out of sync, organ and choir, because the organist couldn't see what was couldn't see what was happening and couldn't fully hear what the choir was singing. Your organist also, if you do this, your organist will love you if you take pictures. Take pictures of the manuals, the stops, the connectors, the pedals, because that will save him, you know, a good half hour or so just setting the organ up, mm -hmm. because he will know what capabilities he's going to have. Mm -hmm. um, Again, coming back to repertoire, if you're singing in a Catholic church, will they want to approve your, con your concert program? A lot of them do, and you know, they will be expecting sacred music only. They will certainly, by and large, want concert appro want program approval for a mass performance. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I mean, it's, it's not all about the gig, it's about the venue, the, the destination as well. If you're, if you're there for three or four days, you can have a good nose round. You can find some decent restaurants. Um, you know, one of the decisions you make at the start, which I should have mentioned, was are you going to go half board or bed and breakfast? Our own members are very, very independently minded and they don't, you know, they don't particularly want group meals. We might have a group meal, say, if we're going to a venue, to a venue outside the, the resort and it's impractical to have dinner after the concert. Or get back to, to the base for so we'll, we'll so I'll organise a group meal after the concert in the concert in the concert location and then we just get a late coach back. Okay. So and again you, you know where where's where are the main bar areas? I mean there's this obviously we were an adult choir so the, it's perhaps not so important for schools to know about this. And <laughs> I can see a situation where a schoolmaster might perhaps not want these kids to know where the good bar venues are. <laughs> and I'm sure but I can tell you that um, 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 our members certainly do. Uh, Ian, I think just from listening to you, it's obvious that preparation is absolutely key. Sorry to interrupt you. We just need to keep on schedule. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah. Preparation I mean, it, it is key. Like, it, it, yeah, I mean, just, just wrapping up. It all sounds like a huge amount of work, but the more you get sorted before, before you go, the less hassle you're going to have when you actually get there. And I suppose I'm planning for a choir that's performing to such a high standard in, you know, in some of the best venues across the world. 
you know, that weight lies heavy on your shoulders as tour organiser delivering a successful tour to um, a huge number of performers. Well, not, um, not, to, not, to make, not to mention that our conductor expects me to have a pretty good feel for the acoustics so you can start choosing the repertoire when I get back. <laughs> Perfect. So you can definitely see where the benefit comes in that for you. Well, Ian, thank you so much again. Um, really appreciate time. As I do appreciate all the time that our speakers have invested with us. Uh, they are clients of ours. We do arrange their tours. They are our friends. But I'm aware that you have spent your time, um, your own time, preparing these um, sessions. We're hugely grateful. There's nothing better than speaking to real people who actually um, create these experiences for their groups in different settings uh, with different kinds of ensembles. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so the next part of our session will be to move along to our Q&A. We've had lots of questions in. Please keep them coming in if you've got any more that you think of. So can I ask the panel please to speak, uh, switch on their cameras and speakers? So on our guest panel today, we have we welcome back Katie, our Managing Director, as well as the four speakers that you've just listened to, as well as Emily and, I had to think about them, Emily and Eleanor from our Concert Tours Department. Now I listen to these girls on the phone every single day arranging these tours and their knowledge is second to none. They have been arranging tours for years and years. So there, undoubtedly we have all the right people on this panel to answer your questions. So with no further ado, I'm going to kick off with the first question. So let me have a look. Um, okay, the first question is directed at Eleanor. So Eleanor, a couple of people have asked about the value of a tour manager. When would you recommend one and what is their role on tour? Okay, well, um, I think it depends on each individual group's requirements, really. Uh, I think... If you're an adult group, the role is probably um, to help take some pressure off you as group leader. So what you'd be doing, um, what you'd be relying on the tour manager for is they'll be there usually to help you with the languages um, and to help you as a go-between at the venues. Uh, they'll be there to check you into excursions if you've got those arranged, check things with the hotel like dietary requirements, things like that. Um, so I think it depends what value you take from that really. Mm -hmm. Certainly um, with groups of school children, sometimes the teachers take on that role and perhaps the only challenge the teachers might have is where there's a language barrier. So um, sometimes we recommend it, for example, in going to places like the Czech Republic or Hungary, sometimes even parts of Italy in particular. Um, for an adult group, sometimes it's to help um, if, you've, if you've got a fixed tour committee who are very much in charge of everything, then they might be happy to manage that themselves but it can help take the pressure off some of those group leaders mm -hmm. if um, you've got a tour manager who's there to speak the language, liaise with all the venues, make sure everything's sorted, save your evening meal that night, ring ahead on everything, make sure you know you don't get lost <laughs> um, because they'll know the local area as well. So I think it depends what you want from it. So hopefully that's a rough summary of what the benefits would be. And then it's up to the group to decide if that's for you. <laughs> but I suppose it's just good to know, Ellen, that, you know, it's just for those groups who perhaps aren't as confident or perhaps first time tourers that there is access to that. Um, for someone who's hugely experienced and hugely confident, maybe not so appropriate. But thank you for that. So our next question is directed at Melanie from an adult choir, Melanie. Apologies, Melanie, if I said your name incorrectly in your prelude to your session, apologies. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it was an honest mistake. Um, so the question is, you mentioned a fundraising app. What was that called and what does it actually do? OK, yeah, it's um, easy fundraising, all one word. If you Google it, you'll get onto the site. The site's actually very good. It explains exactly how it works. Um, all you have to do is, uh, first of all, you register your ensemble as uh, one of the uh, charities although you don't have to be a charity to, to register but I think they just call them charities um, and then um, you can send out a link to all your supporters and all your ensemble members and if they then go on to the easy um, easy fundraising site themselves um, they can install that on their device um, that then just uh, every time they visit a participating re retailer's site, Easy Fundraising goes, oh, would you like a donation from this? Um, which will say, yes, please. Um, and because they've, they've had the link to your, um, your group, 
then your group receives that that donation. So, for example, I bought a new dishwasher over Christmas, and the band got ten pounds from the um, from the sale. It's, it's just that that easy. Such an easy way to raise funds. We're all looking for new ways to uh, make fundraising a little easier. So I'm sure everyone will be scurrying away to get that app downloaded and uh, promote that to their group. Thank you very much. My next question is directed to Emily at Rayburn from a band leader. Um, they've said one of the speakers mentioned the need for a first aid on tour when you are traveling with children. Sorry, a first aid on tour when traveling with children. Is that applicable to adult groups as well? I think it was Jason who mentioned the um, need for a first aid on tour, which mm -hmm. is an extension of what they would provide in school as their general risk assessment and duty of care. So that really, when they take trips off site, that's an extension of that. But for an adult group going on tour, it isn't compulsory to have um, the first aider. Um, you might find that choirs, orchestras will have designated first aiders during their UK, you know, concerts and rehearsals, but they're not necessarily going to be on tour. Mm -hmm. um, However, it's perhaps um, it's good to know that we do provide as part of our tour pack, um, which is also on the Bamboos Travel app, information, a local emergency number. So when you're out in resort, um, those numbers are listed, um, as well as also access to our own emergency, 24 hour emergency phone, um, Rayburn Tours. But so th those numbers are provided, but no, it's not compulsory. Okay, great. Well, anything to obviously to ensure that we've got the safety requirements of a tour TikTok is vital. So thank you for that. Um, the next question is for Eleanor um, from a Coral Society leader. Do you offer locally based tour guides and how would this differ from a Rayburn tour manager? OK, so um, obviously that's linked to what I'd answered before. Um, I mentioned Hungary and the Czech Republic actually before where there is that more of a language barrier. Um, and typically for those sorts of destinations where perhaps there aren't that many British speakers of those language, we do often use local tour managers. Um, so they will be able to interpret for you in those local languages um, should you need it at concert venues and things. Um, they wouldn't travel with you from the UK. Most of the time, if it's someone, um, a sort of Rayburn Tours um, tour manager, they would usually travel with you from the UK, although sometimes they might meet you in resort. We do um, sometimes do that in Italy, where we've got a lot of Italian based English speaking couriers. They basically perform much the same role, but they may not be with you on your journeys outbound and return. Um, sometimes we do. There's a few where they are actually a local tour guide. That's quite rare, though. That's not something you typically expect from a local tour manager. And if you're thinking as well, it may be a local guide. So you can get obviously guides who will arrange guided tours, but that's not typically what a tour manager would do. They won't necessarily be able to give you like um, the history overview of an area. So it's perhaps worth noting that that's something slightly different. I hope mm -hmm. that helps. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I know when I've been on a tour before as a tour manager, it's one of those things like you say with a local tour guide, they're not going to join you for the trip. But in my experience, definitely there was a huge benefit of being on that coach with that group, working alongside the um, coach driver, communicating progress. It was kind of just set the tone for the tour. And I think a full time tour manager kind of gets really immersed in the trip. So very different to the local one. So thanks for that. Um, Emily, what do you do to try and ensure a good concert audience? Yeah, no, we really appreciate the fact that um, generating a good audience for all the concerts in resort is, you know, really important for our groups out on tour. It really adds to the experience if you can have that audience experience and, and feed off um, their reaction to, to all the effort that you've put in in planning for the tour. So we do go to um, great lengths to try and maximise audiences in resort. So really the first port of call is the venue, the venues themselves. Um, they're obviously where you're going to be performing and can um, advertise locally for us and we will supply um, publicity material for that. Um, in, in, so we do do um, uh, printed uh, publicity but also um, electronic uh, publicity as well but we will provide them with those materials um, for them to be able to use. Um, so that's the first point is the venue a really best place to try and get that local audience um, along. Uh, with the advent of social media, it's been around for 
many years already now, but it's be becoming used more and more um, to, to get the word out there electronically through the web, online, um, through Twitter, Facebook, um, all kinds of different channels now that we use. But apart from that, the venue online media, we do use local tourist offices. Um, they're a really important um, place to promote events as well. So the passing audiences as well as local people get to know what's on when, when you're in the resort. So it's a whole host of different ways to try and boost those audiences. It's really reassuring, I'm sure, um, Emily, for a lot of groups, you know, we, we perform, we need an audience, so we have to ensure we do everything to do that. So that's fantastic to hear. Um, I've got a question for Ian. However, Emily or Eleanor may have something to add. If you can't get out on an inspection visit, what do you recommend groups could do as the next best thing? And what questions should they be asking? Can, pro can Rayburn provide photos of venues, for example? Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the, the the key thing you need to be doing is sorting out to the to the nth degree of detail the, the practicalities of your visit to the venue. You know, the, the, what I was saying about lose changing facilities, etc. Mm -hmm. um, what do they want by way of concert? And get, and, and get that all agreed in writing. You know, make sure you, you, you nail down your access times because you, you, you will need time to rehearse in the venue. Do, you're going into this venue, it's, you've never sung in that venue before, you've got no idea what the acoustic's like. Mm -hmm. I've been in places where even on my inspection visit, I thought the acoustic was going to be one way. You know, what, Perugia mm -hmm. Cathedral, I thought, oh no, this isn't going to be a problem. We got in there, it was dreadful. The mm -hmm. resonance was coming off the back wall, a semitone flat, and you've got to adjust for that, to, mm -hmm. you know, from the moment you arrive. Mm -hmm. It was a bit traumatic. <laughs> um, okay. so, so you can use Rayburn for that. Um, most of the these venues, particularly if you're doing somewhere like behind me, which is Segovia Cathedral, there are lots of pictures all over the web. You know, do you know, you can read researching venues is probably not, it's, it's in terms of getting pictures, you won't get the organ detail. But no. you, you can get the you can get the venue to send through a list with the specs, which will at least give your organist a clue. Yeah. You just got to try and adopt a, a a pragmatic approach but you, you still need to go to the idea of, of knowing as much about the venue and, and what they what they're looking for before you get there i suppose emily and ellen i don't know which one of you want to answer this but you obviously have a fantastically close relationship with all the venues that we work with what kind of information can you pass on to clients when they're considering a venue and assessing it for suitability um well i, I was just going to jump in that um there are certainly lots of those things that we will know because it's quite likely one of us will have been there. So in terms of things like where the toilets are, acoustics is a bit more challenging because it possibly depends on exactly what your choir performing, size of your group and things like that. But in terms of locations, organ specifications, things like that, photos of the venue, we also have quite detailed maps. We can, we can pinpoint things on Vermouth. We can give a little bit more detail if needed. We also always, um, sort out things like access times um, and in terms of agreeing a programme if needed. Um, not every venue demands it, but as Ian said, there are some that want to have that nailed down in advance. So that sort of thing will pass on. I think it's just if budget doesn't allow, you know, sometimes or timing to, to go on an inspection trip, there's quite a lot of information we can supply um, in advance anyway. Okay, fantastic. Uh, question for Jason. We are yet to run our first tour. But what do you find are the biggest selling points to get the parents on board and sign their children up for the trip? OK, well, if you're doing a tour for the first time, um, don't be overly disappointed if people don't sign up to begin with. Um, give it a couple of years, maybe, um, for it to sink in. Um, maybe invite a Rayburn representative to come to um, your school or wherever you, 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 you have your rehearsals and to do a little promotional activity. Because if, if it's not embedded in the culture of touring, it might take some time to get going to begin with. Of course, once they've done one, then that's it. You can you can snowball it on. So I, I think um, it's doing a really, really good concert of all the students and showing that you can really perform to a, a really good standard and 
you know, getting out into the community locally and spreading the word that you are an ensemble that is active. Um, that will promote, you know, the, uh, the knowledge of you within the community. And so when it comes for a time to sign people up for the tour or to, in my case, to bring the parents in, everybody knows about you anyway. And so it's just the next step. All right. But um, I, I have to say, when I first promoted the idea of a tour, it didn't ignite initially. It took a little while. And I think the first one even fell flat. So I had to, I had to be patient. Mm -hmm. I think also, um, just from our perspective, um, having a Rayburn representative come along like Elle or Emily to really reassure parents if there are safety questions, if they want to know what the area is going to offer for their children, um, what the hotel is going to be like, where's their young child going to be sleeping. For adult, you know, Parents' evenings are a really critical part of reassurance and the, the beauty of things like Zoom now and the world that we've found ourselves living in is that distance isn't a barrier anymore. So it's, oh, I know it's something that our team feel quite passionately about. So that I would say that's also a great tool. Okay, so I've got one to Mary. I'm a little worried about tackling all the tour admin myself. Is it as big a job as I'm fearing? Any top tips? Um, no, I don't think it's a huge job. I think in gay, I think, um, I think, as Jason said, getting, giving yourself enough time pre-tour, and I was with Jason, I think we did ours at least 15 months before we actually went on tour. And, you know, it's, it's quite hard to ask people to get that turnaround um, in and with you because it's very easy as human beings to say, oh, well, can I wait? But actually, I think from the words go, just be really, really clear that this is going to take a lot of time. So now I had a couple of spreadsheets. Rayburn provide really good spreadsheets so you can make sure and they send you things at, in, you know, in good time. Engaging a couple of singers that were um, quite popular people, but also pretty organized and giving them really quite specific tasks to do. So, for example, when it came to finding out who wanted to share rooms, I gave them that to do. And actually, I think because I'm the MD of the choir, um, actually, it's really nice for them to maybe tell a singer who they want to share with rather than me, because I don't necessarily need or they might not want me to know that information because that's kind of a something that the singers want to know. They don't necessarily want the musical director to kind of know which way they're going. And single rooms, just be really careful that your single rooms um, don't outweigh and leave somebody having to take a single room that doesn't want one. Um, so no, it's not a huge task. Just give yourself time and engage a couple of people that you really trust and be really specific about what you want them to do. I hope that answers your question. I think that's a fantastic answer. I know from our perspective, time is absolutely key. The longer a concert, further ahead a concert tour can be planned, the better. There's nothing worse than taking an inquiry for these guys. I know with someone kind of six to eight months away from when they're planning to tour, you kind of have that, oh, you know, we've got to get, we've got to check out venues, availability of hotel, that are very specific requirements. Definitely planning 12 to 18 months ahead is without a doubt um, the best way to proceed. And then like, you say the admin, administration then can then be spaced out. So thank you for that. I'm really sorry, folks, but we've run out of time. And I know we've all probably got places to go and a certain football match to watch. So I'll just, I want to say a personal thank you because I've met these speakers before. Again, thank you so much, guys. It is really, it's an honour that you've been um, happy to spend this time um, to speak on our behalf. We are very grateful. We're glad that you do work with us. Um, and I'm going to say goodbye and pass over to Katie to bid you all farewell. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nikki. And um, yes, just to reiterate, thank you very much to all our speakers. It was really interesting to hear you all today. Um, it just left for me to say thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. And we hope you found it really useful. Um, we have run out of time for questions. So if there are any unanswered questions or you've suddenly thought of another question, please still you know, type it in that chat box and we will get back to you with an answer. We'd also really love to have your feedback on how you found today's webinar. So with that in mind, we will be sending you an email in the next couple of days, just with a short survey on it. It'd be really, really helpful if you could fill that in for us, just so we can, we can gauge future webinars. And all that I need to say now is just thank you once again and goodbye. <laughs>